All right. Welcome back, everybody. This is day one, Seven Figure Seller Summit live recap. I'm super excited that everybody can join us. And um, I'm really excited to have Karen Thomas and Liron Hirschkorn with us here today. How's it going, guys? Great. Thank you. Excellent. Excellent. All right. So because we are live and it is day one, uh, there's the element of surprise. So <laughs> we may get some additional guests on. Um, and because we are live, those of you that are tuning in from home, if you can please type your name and where you're joining us from, that would be great. Okay. So Karen, um, why don't we start with you? Uh, where are you joining us from? And if you, could you share a little bit more about you know, your session today for those of uh, people watching that haven't saw it yet? Yes, well, thank you so much, Gary, for having me on. It's always a pleasure talking with you. And of course, Liron, the legend, my favorite people. So yeah, I'm super grateful to be here. I am currently in Irvine, California, in Southern California. It's about 70, degree, 70 degrees outside. So, you know, I have nothing to complain about. It's, it's a great life. Um, but yeah, I had a great session with you earlier today, Gary, talking about how to create a powerful listing on Amazon that converts going forward in 2021. Uh, we touched on some really important topics of keyword research on, you know, creating sales copy that resonates with your, your target demographic. We talked about images. We talked about video. We talked about um, a plus content. We just talked about, you know, some of the highs and lows of being an entrepreneur and some of, you know, the lessons that I've learned, the good and the bad. And, and it's, yeah, it was, it was a really great conversation we had. Awesome. And, you know, Karen has a uh, illustrious background as a seven figure seller. And then she's also a brand evangelist at Helium 10. So she really knows all of the different tools and methodology out there to really create a listing that converts. So if any of you guys haven't seen Karen's session, I highly recommend it. It's still going on, you know, day one. Now's your chance because we're focusing all about the, the fundamentals and also the mindset. All right. So if those of you guys watching us can see us, please type your name and uh, where you're watching from, from the chat. Okay. And next I like to welcome the Amazon rockstar legend. That is Liron Hirschkorn. How's it going Liron? Great. Thank you. How are you? Good, good. So Liron, I loved how you kicked things off today. You really set out the, the whole mindset of, um, you know, a seven figure seller, but at the same time, you know, right now, many of us were working from home, you know, we may be parents. Um, I, I think, I think all of us here are you know, on the panel today. We're all parents, right? We're trying to balance our, our business with our family time with our kids and with our spouse, you know, so I, I really love how you, you know, kind of shared a little bit about what what you did you know with your routines and also you know talking about focus right for uh, marketing on amazon so liron maybe to to kick things off maybe you can give us like a like a quick tidbit you know for those of the people watching that maybe missed the, the first session you know to to share yeah um i think i think um we we kind of we started off talking about um mindset working from home how how our you know how am I? How are people kind of managing things um, in their in their life um, where everybody's at home? Maybe uh, I, I imagine for a lot of people in the last year, things are different. Even if you were working from home, maybe your kids were in school and now they're on Zoom school, or maybe your spouse was working somewhere and now they're now they're home and kind of dealing with both the you know the the pros and and cons or the challenges that um, that that you know brings in. Um, you know, and some of the some of the way kind of I deal with it personally, and then and then I think in the second half of our talk, we kind of moved to talking more on the you know on the on the marketing side. Um, one thing that this reminds me of is um, we talked a little bit about the the work from home component, and so you know I think at the end of the day you just have to do your best in terms of balancing out you know um, and maybe have certain principles that can help you in making those decisions of kind of like. Uh, going about your day, you know, one of the things I, I spoke to you about was, um, yeah, you know, there isn't always necessarily a balance, but, you know, uh, taking time 
if your kids are home taking time throughout the day to spend a little bit of time with them or you know one concept um i actually spoke about i was on um carlos alvarez's podcast uh, this week and we recorded a session and um i shared with him i don't know if i shared it uh, i don't remember if i shared this in the talk but i shared with him a concept that i heard last year um i think in my talk with you i probably mentioned either this time or last time jesse etzler and then that i follow him and one of the things that he says um that resonated with me that's in the back of my mind when things are coming up for me during the day is uh never say no to a baseball catch right so you know if whenever is like basically whenever his kids ask him to do something with them play with them do something like he just doesn't say no he just made a kind of like a rule for himself you know um and this is very it's very easy to dismiss you know your kid your spouse whatever right like these things in your life because you're too busy working but i also don't want to look back in 10 years knowing all i did was work um and so having these little concepts make a difference for me in terms of um you know when when uh my daughter you know at eight o'clock comes to me and says hey will you play minecraft with me or, or something then you know now i'll say yes i'll do it for 10 or 15 minutes you know i'm not taking three hours on a thursday night but i'll take 10 or 15 minutes and i'll say yes just because i have this concept in my mind and so i think the sort of essence of mindset is learning these kind of small principles that can resonate with you um that will that will stick right and um to me that that like saying never say no to a baseball catch is one of those things that like you know if you hear it then maybe next time your kid is you know nagging you for something you maybe won't see it that way you'll maybe see it a little bit differently and may change your perspective and change your outlook and i think your perspective is kind of the 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 fundamental of having you know a good mindset or the right mindset is the 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 way you look at something which you know you can look at something as a negative or a positive yeah 100 percent. i agree you know i you know my son harrison he's uh he's two years old now so i'm looking forward to pretty soon we're gonna play catch you know so but even you know every day i try to schedule some time to you know spend some time with with my son uh, even though we're running like all these you know fun things with the business but yeah i agree 100 percent, Leron. and um i just want to give a quick shout out to a couple people watching that's tuning in uh easy uh, hi gary from myc so yeah this is gary as well for him watched four sessions already today awesome so if you want to weigh in uh any questions definitely you know now's the chance right and also wanted to give a quick shout out to Rosalind from brisbane australia good day Rosalind. great to have you all right and for those of you guys watching sharing is caring if you know a, a friend or someone else that's selling online or on amazon why not invite them to join on live right i mean we have we have Karen, we have Liron, and you know this is going to be a, a great time for you to help you with your mindset, with the fundamentals. Um, you know, talking about not only creating a listing but also some ideas about product selection. So I think this could be super valuable, guys. All right. So Karen, I'm curious, what what do you think about this? You know, in terms of mindset. You know, so Liron said, you know, never say no to a baseball catch. I know you're a mom as well, right? And you're running your successful business. I'm curious, what do you think about this? Yeah, it's it's certainly no joke being a parent. It's it's certainly very rewarding, but it's tricky sometimes. I love that you know Liron is willing to play Minecraft. I have to say, I'm not quite willing to do that. I'm like, let's do activities that I like to do, like dance, <laughs> to play a board game. But you know, I have my limits too, Karen. But my okay. wife, my <laughs> wife won't play Minecraft. But there are certain games like you know, mm. pretty 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 princess that you know that's kind of like, <laughs> that's where I cross. <laughs> Yeah, that's where you're like, the all-time you know, champ at that, aren't you? The line on, in the I think I saw on, you on uh, on TikTok, right? Yeah, on on what I'll say, but uh, <laughs> yeah, my my wife also doesn't doesn't uh, won't won't play Minecraft either. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's just certain things I just won't do, you know. But I'm glad you're in the same boat. There's certain things, you know, we just have to say I can't do that. But no, I agree. I think I think as a parent, you do have some advantages, you know. A lot of times, I'll be honest, I've kind of felt sorry for myself, like oh, so hard to get stuff done. You know, you're exhausted all day and then you're trying to, you know, cook meals and do dishes and laundry and all that stuff. But there's also a lot of advantages, right? Of you have more, I don't want to say more, but for me, it is certainly something that pushes me to have a purpose and to like, 
you know, create a better life for them than I had for myself. So I think it is, it comes with a lot of beautiful gifts and challenges. And I think it's also really helped me value a lot of things about like my childhood as well. And maybe some things that I had like some resentment or something. I don't know. It has, it just has been a really great gift to kind of take it full circle and understand like how difficult it is when you love someone, you want to give them everything, but you have some, some challenges. And yeah, like, I don't know about you guys, but like my parents weren't entrepreneurs. My mom was a stay at home mom. And so I'm definitely learning to balance things that, you know, this is the first, I, I didn't have a mentor that showed me, you know, how to do both and how to keep your sanity. And you know what I mean? So it's all just a work in progress, but it's a fun, it's a fun experiment for sure. And I think it's going pretty well. I'm pretty, pretty proud of my kids. So I think there's certainly great things that I'm learning and doing along the way. Uh, Gary, you're muted. <laughs> Good call. Uh, Karen, thank you much. Thank you so much for sharing that. And I agree. I mean, dealing with kids and running the business at the same time, it's not easy. And at the same time, uh, I see we have a surprise guest that just joined us, the one and only Tim Jordan. How's it going, Tim? I'm supposed to be here, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you are. Well, you said surprise. So I'll tell you what happened is hey, I flew I think surprise guest was was a uh, uh, interchangeable for late guest maybe. And uh, <laughs> Dude, <laughs> I, um, so my excuse is I'm normally in Central Time and I flew to Miami last night. So in Miami, and my calendars some work and some don't when it transfers, like when it swap mm. swaps times around. So like if you look at my Google Calendar, look, yeah, I'm, I know what you mean. I'm still uh oh, I'm still not to it yet. See, yeah, but then I looked yeah. at my phone. I'm like, oh, Gary's live. Oh, crap. Gary's live. <laughs> so, Tim, what you're saying, what you're saying is you're early. It's something. I don't know. I don't know how that works. All those time zones are too confusing for me. Yeah. Well, well, Tim, thanks so much. I'm glad you could join us. And, you know, Tim, for those of you guys that don't know him, he's uh, he's the founder of Private Label Legion. He's a seven figure seller. He also runs the AM PM podcast. And then on day one, he really laid down how seven figure sellers are finding profitable product ideas in 2021. So for those of the, the people watching out there, maybe they missed your session. Uh, why should they watch your, your session, Tim? Well, I would say watch my session, not just because it's the only way to do things. You know, that's one thing I'm learning. There is so much opportunity and so many, so many ways to win in e-commerce. But still, and I know Laurent will agree with me, like one of the biggest struggles that people have is finding the right product to sell. Right. And and knowing some different methods of, of doing that definitely helps. So uh, what I shared in my session was basically some of the outside of the box and the unique ways that I find potential product opportunities and then how to vet them and validate them um, to try to get ahead of the curve before products become saturated. That's fact, awesome. Man. That's the biggest yeah. that's the biggest reason people fail, in my opinion. I agree. Is yeah. not, not selecting the right product. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I really love what you know Tim had to say because he's really zigging when everyone else is zagging, right? I mean, he's not relying only on the product research tools. He's actually going off of Amazon, right? And you know, I don't want to give too much away, but you know, he's talking about looking on other sites like Etsy and uh, even YouTube, right? And we, we're spending like hours and hours on YouTube anyway, so you might as well make it constructive, right? So I think yep. that. You know that's 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 awesome what what Tim is doing. I'm curious, um, maybe Karen or or Liron, if you'd like to weigh in on you know finding profitable product ideas. You know, what advice would you give people watching? You know, regardless, maybe some of them are at the seven figure level. You know, they're trying to scale up, or maybe some other people they're just starting out. What advice would you give to them? I'm curious. And yeah, you know, maybe Karen, if you'd like to start. Yeah, I think absolutely. I mean. Tim certainly is incredible at doing this. I love what he shared in Project X and, you know, he shared a lot of great ideas in your session as well today. But I think sometimes not only finding really good, unique, you know, low competition products, it can also help when you basically differentiate yourself where you're kind of even entering a competitive niche, but you are providing something different. I mean, it's a different offer. It's a different, um, bundle package or it's, you know, an extra gift. So all of a sudden you can come and kind of disrupt the market a bit more and be different, right? 
And also just finding more niche markets where, you know, maybe, and I use this example a lot. This is actually from Tomer Rabinovich, um, super clever, but he's an example of like bath bombs where, you know, it's super competitive. There's thousands and thousands of listings. The top competitors on the first page have, you know, 10,000 reviews. But one really smart person found keywords like, for example, bath bomb for men, and they created their whole business around that keyword. And so instead of, you know, being like the bright, colorful, you know, really smelly bath bombs, they are like more targeted for that niche market of just men. So they're like darker colors, the packaging's like more, you know, rustic and manly. So it's not only do they have those keywords, but when people hit that listing, it's totally showing that they're in the right place, that this is a product just for men. And so they came in and disrupted that market and really took that that niche and, you know, created a good, you know, $25,000 a month business just on that one product. So I think you have to be a little bit more clever and finding different niches and finding different ways that you can, you know, create a new product offering, even with, you know, very competitive markets. Yeah. Yeah. That's great advice. I, I love how you, you unpack that. I mean, bath bombs for men, right? You gotta really go into the sub niche, right? As they say, the, the riches are in the niches. So yeah. for everybody watching out there, if you have any questions, I mean, this is a golden opportunity. It's, this is like a mastermind of some of the top minds in the whole Amazon and e-commerce space. You know, we have Karen Thomas, we have Tim Jordan, we have Lee Run, you know, so don't let this opportunity pass you by. You know, maybe you're stuck in product selection, you know, hit them up, you know, now's your chance, right? Or maybe, you know, mindset, if you're stuck in analysis paralysis, you know, I think this is a golden opportunity. So, um, you know, Talking about product selection, anything else you guys would like to add to that? Yeah, Gary, I'll add one more thing. Um, you know, sometimes uh, I, I get, I, I would say almost almost every day, um, you know, people message me and show me their products because we manage ads and they say, hey, can you help me? Can you run my ads, uh, et cetera. And, you know, I would say a, a big percentage of the time I don't take it on because Ads is not the problem that the person has. Uh, they think it's a problem that the per that they have. Their 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 product isn't selling, but it's really they chose the wrong product. And I look at the product, and my question to like my question to them would be if I if I took you know uh, an hour in depth with the person is, did you ask yourself at any time when you were selecting this product, why is somebody going to buy my product? Right, like you. A lot of what I see is people selecting a product and creating a great listing, but it's not really enough. You know, when you're, when you're, you know, when you go and, you know, somebody recently showed me, I don't know, it was like a jump rope. I see glute bands. I see these products that are very, very, very competitive. Now you can get into any market on Amazon if you have enough capital. So one answer could be, yeah, I'm going to, brute force bully my way to the top. Okay, I'm gonna sell at 50% of the price for the next you know, year, and I'm gonna accumulate 3000 reviews and catch up to my competitors. That could be an answer, but for most people, it's not really um, that's not really an option. Then they don't wanna lose money or willing to lose money. And the reality is you don't have to. There are products you could choose that you could be profitable in month two or even month one if you chose the right product. So I think if you ask yourself, why would somebody buy my product? Um, and also think about answers that are realistic that you're not BSing yourself, okay? For example, a lot of people tell me my my quality is better, okay? But if the entire market is at, uh, at four and a half stars, then nobody will know your quality is better, right? It means people already like the quality that's there. You need to find you know, a, a difference in the product, something in the design, something, you know, additional with it, um, or going to markets that are not as competitive. And that is, and, you know, you'll find um, a lot of hacks and tactics and stuff with selling on Amazon. But one, none of those will work if you chose the right, the wrong product, or they only work short term. And two, if you choose the right product, you don't need, you don't need to implement all those you know, hacks and you can really literally create a great listing, uh, run, you know, be reasonably okay at, at running some ads and knowing how to optimize and you could be off to the races. Uh, and then you can add variations and take advantage of the existing traffic and double down on it and create, create a listing that sells. But if you chose the wrong product, 
it's an you know it's like trying to push a giant rock uphill you you know you it's just extremely difficult and no tactic that you try to employ at that point will help which is why which is why for the most part we re i reject most of the people that come to me with products to to run their ads because you know it's not going to be beneficial for me or them it's it's going to be a, fa a fail um and to me the biggest this is the biggest question you need to ask yourself like why would somebody purchase this uh especially on amazon which is such a marketplace driven by reviews and price yeah i think the expression that always pops into my mind being a colorful southerner is you could put lipstick on a pig but it's still a pig right and like people think that they can take a horrible product launch karen's trying not to laugh she's trying to stay classier than that but she's struggling i see it but like yeah to laurent's point perfectly like people think that ppc is their problem or people think that black hat competitors are their problem or people think that amazon's the problem when you're just trying to put lipstick on a pig like it's a giant turd and you just you got to walk away from it but going back to product selection i, I want to say this too i know there are a lot of people that are super frustrated and they're super discouraged and maybe a little bit burned out trying to find these products. And there's a lot of people telling them things like, Hey, Amazon's completely saturated. Like I was on a clubhouse the other day with somebody <laughs> who um, professes to be an expert. And he literally said, there's no way to sell anything on Amazon unless you cut your price down to nothing and you can't compete with the Chinese. So why would you compete with the Chinese? Just work with the Chinese. And I was like jumping up and down screaming. I'm like, no, if you're listening to this, ignore this. This is wrong. Like there are so many ways to win right now. I'm getting ready to launch a product. It's a brand of boat accessories, boating accessories. I never in a million years would have thought I'm launching boating accessories, but they're going to be three times higher the price than all my competitors. See, when I look at it, it looks saturated and it looks, um, you know, like there's all these 15, 17, $18 items. But when I start researching, you can have a higher end product. You can have a more industrial version of this, right? And there's massive amounts of search volume. Um, so I, I think there's more than, you know, more than one way to skin a cat, as they say. And I think people need to be encouraged that there are opportunities. And if they're really, really struggling, like Laurent said, take a good hard look and see, like, is your problem really that you can't optimize your PPC to a 0.2% difference in ACoS? Like if you're margin of success or failure is based on one or two percent of a cost then your margins are too low your problem isn't your a cost your problem is your product but there are there are tons of opportunities out there still and and at the same time to add to that it's knowing when to cut off that product right like yeah. knowing when knowing when to when to kill the product and i would say whatever whenever you think it is it should be earlier hey laron how many products do you think you've killed in the past five years Many products. <laughs> no, I, someone asked me and I couldn't remember. Um, and I'm learning to cut them faster because I've had a lot of products that I cut off after they were like completely sunk. And I've started getting a little better. And it's it's hard because you might have a product that you're selling 40, 50 units a day and you don't want to stop. But I'll literally stop reordering it because I know, hey, I'm going to end up with a warehouse full of this stuff. Um, but I tell people too, don't get frustrated. Don't get discouraged. Don't get upset about that. Like you made some money on that. And you also learned a tremendous amount, like you are paying for your MBA in e-com selling, right? Um, so don't think of that as, oh, Amazon sucks, it's a failure because this one product got saturated or this one product I got obliterated by competitors. Just keep moving on to the next one and stay nimble. Yeah, I mean, thanks. No, I think this is super valuable, guys. And just to recap, product selection, right? This is really the the one thing it's like the lead domino if you get this right it makes everything else easier but if you get it wrong you know like what tim said it's like putting a lipstick on a pig it's not going to work right no matter how much money from ppc you're throwing at it i mean liron runs an agency you'll actually turn your product down if it's if it's not you know a profitable product right so i, I think you know 100 percent is super valuable guys and also knowing your numbers you know this is one of the the key things that i'm seeing you know, sellers that are successful what they're doing, right? You gotta know at the end of the day, you know, can you afford to, to sell this product? And also knowing your inventory, right? You know, dealing with all the Amazon restrictions, you know, can I even, you know, make this affordable without having to resort to like 3PO or separate all of your shipments? So um, this is awesome, guys, I, I love it. And then we have some questions in the, in the chat. So uh, let, let's get to these questions, if that's cool with you guys, all right? Okay, so. First, we have from Easy. Why are shipping costs from China increasing so dramatically? It makes me want to source from elsewhere. 
Tim, would you like to tackle this? I know you you were running the logistics company before. Yeah, I'm, it could take an hour to answer this, but I'll tell you. Um, Let's get to the, the 80-20 of this. <laughs> yeah, so I'll tell you the biggest, uh, what I'm seeing, I don't know if this is the correct answer globally, but what I'm seeing is the correct answer, is there is two main components. One, a shortage of airspace, right? Like a lot of people still ship by air. And I think more than half of the products shipped via air cargo are actually in the bellies of passenger planes. There's really no passenger planes coming in out of China. So that's made air shipping just ridiculous. The second thing with ocean shipping is lack of containers and chassis. All right. So what happens is the world is just moving containers and chassis are like the truck axles that these containers sit on. They move them around. And there's a finite number of containers. And while there was balance, these containers would go somewhere, be unloaded, be reloaded, go somewhere else. And they usually always end up in China. Even small countries like the UK, their number one export in the entire country is empty containers because they have to ship them back out to be reloaded and brought back. What's happened with COVID is the infrastructure slowed down. So warehouses have cut staffing. Um, trucking companies have people that are not being allowed into storage facilities. Um, even like your really large 3PLs are having to cut staffing, close, things like that. So what's happening is all these containers are grinding to a halt, a halt where a container used to be able to land in the US, get on a truck, go to somewhere, be unloaded, come back and get on a ship in five days. Now that lead time is like four months. So containers are at a freaking premium in China. Um, they can't get them there fast enough. And also think about the two large ships that have lost humongous amounts of um, containers this year. Those ships were bringing, what, two or 3,000 containers back and forth every month. Those, those ships are out of commission. They're sitting in dry dock right now, right, being inspected and all that crap. So really, it's, it's the container shipping backlog that's raising prices because demand is spiked. Excellent. Excellent. I, I know that, you know, seasonality, like we're in Chinese New Year right now. So every year before Chinese New Year, there's a huge rush. Everyone's trying to get their shipment out before the shutdown. So, I mean, you'll always see the spike every year before Chinese New Year. But I yeah. think the key question is after Chinese New Year, are we going to see the rates go down or are we going to you know, continue to see the high rates? And I think that's that's the big question. But I agree with everything that, that Tim shared. Also, the, with this question yeah. is assuming is assuming a few things. It's yeah. assuming the price is going to be better from somewhere else, which yeah. if it's there's not. a shortage, it's not. Um, it's also assuming you can get your product done somewhere else, which is also a big, a big assumption. <laughs> big tough, yeah. Um, or Correct. at the same price or at the same quantity or everything else. So, yeah, yeah, a lot of people want to source. I would love to source from my backyard if I could. <laughs> um, right. So a lot of people want to source away from China. It's not as easy. Um, you know, as a town, especially the smaller you are, I think the more challenging it is because China will do, you know, 100 units, 200 units, 300 units. A lot of places around the world will not. I will say, though, there is hope because if your prices have increased, so is everybody else's prices. So if we look at the short term, we say my product is $15. I'm competitive. If my shipping cost goes up, I have to raise it to $17. Well, so does all your competition. Because nobody else has cheap shipping. It's all expensive. So you may have to wait for them to run out of inventory and restock. Like there will be a natural balance that has to occur. But once it balances out, it should be level across the board. Right. So if everybody's shipping cost doubles, you know, everybody's shipping cost doubles. So you should be able right. to stay competitive as well. Yeah. And when, you know, in other words, when the tide rises, all of the boats rise. Right. So everyone's yep. getting hit with the same, the, the cost increases. All right. Yep. So easy. That's a great question. And thanks so much guys for answering that. So let's keep going. There's a very, right. uh, a very on subject uh, analogy there. Gary. Yes. yes. <laughs> 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 yeah. All right. So uh, welcome Wendy from Sydney, Australia. Great. And uh, asked me, had a question, with so much to do and so much to learn, how would you unpack and go step by step? So, I mean, what do you guys think? Karen or Liron or Tim, what do you guys think? I'll, uh, I'll step in just to say that you're, you, you're, in a sense, answering the question. Um, the, the, the answer is step by step, right? So learn, you know, learn, it depends, depending on where you are in the process, learn about product selection using some of the tools like Helium, for example, on product selection and how to go about it. And then, you know, 
after you learn product selection and get some samples and do that, then you'll have, if you do order a product, you'll have a chance to learn about listing creation and SEO and keywords. I mean, you, you want to, that, that should be part of your product selection, but you'll, you'll learn there, right? And then you learn about brand registry and A plus content and the creative side of the business. And then when you launch, you'll can learn about PPC and, and those things. So, uh, step-by-step step, once you do it, you know, you'll, you'll learn when you go through the whole cycle of sourcing and launching a product, you'll go through a, a lot of the steps that you need to, in terms of, uh, learning some of the basics. So I think you just, I think the answer is you just do it, uh, and learn along the way. Yeah. I, I was going to say, you have to learn by doing, and what I see people trying to do is become comfortable with all 922 facets of selling online. Like it's never going to happen until you actually start doing a little bit at a time. Like you can't drink from a fire hose and survive, right? So one thing that I'm telling people to do, and I think all of us on the panel here, you know, we focus on building our own brands, private label, even though I hate that term. Um, but that's kind of a big thing. Like we have to do a lot. So I'm even telling people right now, if you are just stuck, if you can't make the decision of, hey, which, you know, I'm going to take this product and a source, I'm going to drop the money on it, give it a test run. And one of the ways I've been telling people to do that is to literally go to the dollar store. Now, I'm not a huge fan of long term business of arbitrage or wholesale, but hear me out. If you need to practice the things like setting up a listing, setting up PPC campaigns, you know, optimizing keyword research, I can walk into the Dollar General store and buy uh, 12 or 15 rubber spatulas. And I could bundle those two or three in a pack, which creates a unique ace and list them on Amazon. Right. Am I going to make money at that? No. But for fifty dollars, twenty dollars, I can get something that I can learn how to set up my shipments. I can learn how to set up a listing. I can learn, you know, all of these things, which takes away some of that worry. Um, now, again, I'm not advocating going to create bundles to sell online from the dollar store, but I'm just saying get your hands on something that's unique ace and, and practice. If the product sucks, you get bad reviews. It doesn't affect really your seller account that much. You're going to trash those ASINs. But if you're literally sitting there going, man, I think I want to drop 10 grand on this or five grand even, you know, on this, you know, quarter of a container of stuff. But you're just so scared. You can go do some creative things to get the practice and walk through the steps and make sure that you're learning along the way before taking a big plunge. Absolutely. Yeah. Excellent. All right. So let's keep going, guys. We have a lot of questions. Next, uh, back to easy. Building a tribe or a following seems to be so popular now. Blogging, blogging, social media influencers seem to be crucial. Yes. Uh, what, is, what is the question? <laughs> you know, when somebody, yeah. so, so uh, somebody, you know, we've been spending our time on Clubhouse and people come up and they'll come up for questions, but they don't really know how to ask questions. So the right. moderators in the rooms will say, when you ask a question, start the question with, my question is, so I'll go back to you and say, uh, it sounds to me like your question is, uh, you know, where you should, uh, where you should be focusing or if that stuff is crucial. My, my, my answer to you would be none of this is crucial when you're, if you're, if you're starting, there's leverage Great. the existing traffic and opportunity that inside Amazon provides you. And then, you know, all this sexy stuff, you know, focus on later on after you have some success first, but, um, wouldn't be my first my first uh, focus, unless I was starting off Amazon, which uh, I think you do need some of this stuff, but um, yeah. starting on Amazon, I, I wouldn't focus on any of this. Yeah, I think, you know, for if you are just starting out, I mean, I would definitely, you know, check out Karen's section. You know, she really lays down the fundamentals of creating an Amazon listing that converts, you know, starting from the keyword research, you know, using the, the title with the keyword juice, you know, images, um, just, you know, start with that. And then later, you know, as you're growing your business, maybe you hit five figures or six figures, you want to differentiate, you want to build that list, right? Then you can check out some of that, you know, the sexy stuff like social media influencers, etc. But I, I would say, you know, don't, don't try to like, you know, put the, the wagon from the horse, get, right? Get, you got to get, get the, the horse, right? Get good at the not sexy stuff, you know, operations, yeah. Yeah. logistics, shipping, knowing, exactly. knowing your numbers, how to run a business, yeah. how to create SOPs and hire VAs, all yes. the, all the non sexy stuff people don't really talk about, uh, yes. you know, on Facebook, get, get better at that first. Yes. hundred percent. All right. So let's keep going guys. So BG says how to keep a good mindset when your product is not selling as much as you expect it. How to know when is the mistake so I can learn from it. It's a good question. Um, 
does anyone i don't i don't want to feel like i'm hogging all the answers uh if anyone else wants to share jump in i'm waiting for karen to jump in hmm. is karen frozen karen are you Maybe, frozen yeah. uh, she's, <laughs> yeah. she's ignoring me karen, yeah. karen, karen you're frozen all right so um okay. i'll say this one thing is you are going to make mistakes if you don't make mistakes you're doing something wrong Right. I can I have a in my home office, I have a bookshelf of like probably 15 products that lost me money, sucked like something. Right. And it just reminds me that like, there she is. Hi, Karen. Sorry, guys. My internet's struggling. We were talking to you and you were like this, just sitting. And I'm like, is she ignoring us? <laughs> um, so, um, so just keep in mind that your mistake is an education. Your mistake is an, you know, investment in experience. And if you're not making mistakes, you're not trying. Right. So take mm -hmm. your mistakes and think of them as investment and, and keep moving on. I don't know a single person that's ever been successful that didn't didn't have those mistakes, those failures, those hard lessons. That's just like mm -hmm. part of the, the you know, right of passage. Right of passage. Exactly. So yeah. um, it sucks. And there's other ways that you can, you know, other things you can do to kind of help cope with that. Um, I'm not always great at that. Like. <laughs> There have been times when I've, you know, I've literally been like in tears staring at my computer screen thinking, how do I salvage this? What do I do now? Um, but I do know that every time that's been a struggle for me, it was one of the better learning experiences of my life. Um, mm -hmm. Gary, so the question here is how do you keep a good mindset when your product is not selling as much as you expected? And I, I think it's to change your expectation, right? Um, in the in the first place. So um Tony Robbins, when I went last year, he said that somebody gets depressed when your current situation doesn't match the blueprint of kind of wh where you want it to be, right? Like you're you're depressed or unhappy or sad or whatever, because where you expect to be in your current situation in life and whatever it is, or in a product, whatever, isn't what you expected it to be. So you need to be able to know that as an entrepreneur, you will continuously need to adapt um and being and that challenges are that that problems are kind of like what you signed up for when you signed up for entrepreneurship like just expect to deal with problems all day every day and solving those problems is kind of how you add value and how you get paid um and so you know if the product isn't selling what you expected then change your expectations and go on to the next product or you know move, move on but just know that it's kind of like what you signed what you signed up for, probably at any level, right? Like a uh, big company, you know, Apple will release the results and the earnings don't uh, match the expectations, stock goes down, right? CEO of Apple needs to deal with it the same level as you need to, just, just you know, bigger problems. Um, so I, I think you just need to realize that it's part, it's part of the game. Yeah, I feel like that's our job as the entrepreneurs and uh, you know, you got a thumbs up from, from that. that that's great. I mean, as, as entrepreneurs, our job is to solve problems, right? That's what we're, we're, that's why we're here, right? I mean, we're creating products to help people, you know, live better, you know, maybe spend better time with their family, um, you know, and also, you know, dealing with these problems, right? I mean, one of the products that I launched recently is um, outdoors. It's like, like a toy product that um, I just remembered like my dad and I, we used to, you know, play, you know, this, when we were kids, I'm like, Hey, you know, I, I just remember that, you know, I, and you know, I, I did, I ran the numbers and, you know, I launched it and it's getting some success. So I think, you know, keep that in mind. Right. I mean, we're solving problems as entrepreneurs and you're right. I mean, they don't teach you to do this in school. Right. That's why, that's why we're here. That's why we're learning from, you know, all these super talented people like, like Karen, like Leron, like Tim. But one thing that I know is at the end of the day, I mean, these guys aren't Superman or Superwoman. They're they're like you and me, right? I mean, they have their their strengths, but they have their flaws as well. But it's you know how you how you pivot with it, just, right? You, you know, either win or you learn. Media. What's that? I said I just don't show them on social media. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, excellent, guys. All right, so let's keep going. We have some more questions. So, ask me. Said, what is your view on using VAs and what you sh what should you use them for? comments guys it's also a huge question yeah yes yeah. also real quick if you guys don't mind yes please karen my personal viewpoint i've learned this in some ways the hard way is figuring out what your 
greatest strengths are? Like, what is the thing that only you can do? And then what are the things that you're good at, but you can possibly outsource and teach someone? And like Liron said, like having SOPs where it's so dialed into that, even someone that has no experience can figure it out. Just like turn the lever on. Like that's how specific you're going to step by step. I think that's so crucial. So figuring out like, what are the things that are the best use of your time? And then what are the things that you can create really specific, easy to follow SOP so that you can hire a VA to do them? And and those are the types of things that, you know, I don't, maybe I'm good at, but I don't like to do and they're not the best use of my time. So I think that's very much worth investing in a VA to help with some of those things, whether that's customer service, whether that's, you know, graphic design or press releases or stuff like that. What do you guys think about it? Yeah, so I'll, I'll add in that the the question is, the question um, is basically the, uh, what a VA does and, or don't look at a VA, look at a VA as anyone on your team, right? Like whether they're an employee or, yes. or a virtual assistant, uh, we're all virtual now. So um, the question really is, do you need a VA first and, and what should you use them for? If you don't know, you, you may not need one. Um, what you, when the time, when you need a VA is when there are so many things you need to do in your business that you only want to then start spending your time on the highest uh, level things that are producing the most profit on, on the, on the things where you're spending, you know, when you started the business, you know, they were producing $10 an hour or $50 an hour. And now, your one hour is worth a thousand dollars because you're doing product selection or five thousand dollars or ten thousand dollars because that product's going to generate that profit and you've done two or three hours of product selection when you've exhausted spending all the time in your business and you realize you can't get certain things done low level things are where you start out delegating to other people that are easy to delegate like customer service repeatable things like your shipments whatever repeatable easy things you start to write out your day and you start to figure out who else who else can do this but there's one guaranteed thing you will not be able to grow beyond a certain point without having other people in your business but it also may not be the right time if you're very early to spend money on things where you could be doing them you should learn every aspect of your business even if you're going to hire um, or you should at least know at a high level what those things are and you know I don't know how to do accounting but I know what I can expect from my accountant or what I want them to do for me um so you know you need to think about have you exhausted all the things in the business are there things you want to spend more of your time on that you can't and at that point i would look to see what you can what you can um, outsource but you know the and, and also just as a general statement the skill set that you need to go from you know zero to a million will be the only way you'll go from one to ten is by scale is by scaling and having leverage whether that's automation and tools like software or through capital and through people and i think that people think of a va as like i don't want to do that let me just offload this and it doesn't work that way because delegation requires work also so you have to appropriately manage you have to set sops in place you have to have processes procedures i am not going to wake up every morning and in one 45 minute period monitor and reconcile my inventory projections but I can quickly build a flow chart and an SOP of how to do that and pass it off and make sure that happens. Right. And when people talk about being able to afford assistance, right? Like sometimes I don't even like this term virtual assistants or VAs because we think like, like they are team members, like Laurent said, like these are just employees. Now, do we utilize, you know, places that are less expensive and that need the work? Yes. But I think that if you value your own time, you get to the point where you can't afford not to start replacing yourself. And what I mean is if you're running a business, even if you're just getting started, you need to be thinking of yourself as a $50 an hour employee to your own business. Now, if you can trade your one hour for someone else's one hour and you're paying them six or seven dollars an hour, like you are making money theoretically by giving yourself more hours by replacing, you know, replacing an hour someone else. So if I can spend two days, you know, building an incredible SOP and a workflow and offload two hours of my day to this person that's going to cost me $12 for those two hours. And I've saved myself 50 or $100 of my own time. You know, I hope that kind of makes sense. And then the third thing I'd say is don't go cheap. Everybody has this magical idea of virtual assistance. I can hire someone in the Philippines for $3 an hour. No, you can't. If you're hiring someone for $3 an hour, they're going to be 
they're, they're, there are exceptions, but they're likely going to be terrible. They're likely going to not be able to live fully on $3 an hour. So they're taking multiple jobs. You guys have all seen this, like someone that you're paying and they dip out for four hours. You're like, where'd they go? And then you see them posting other jobs on free up and, you know, not free up, but, uh, uh, online jobs, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Online jobs are looking for other full-time jobs. It's, it's crazy. So for me, my Filipino VAs, I'm paying between six and $9 an hour based on the skill and putting them to work full time because then they're dedicated. They feel like I'm, you know, giving them enough work and enough income. They don't have to go out and find it. So just three little random tips for VAs for me. That's awesome. Yeah. Anything else you guys like to share before we move on? We're good. All right, great. Keep these questions coming guys. What is a reasonable MOQ for a customized product? Some suppliers have insisted up to 10,000. That's ridiculous. It is, is it a negotiation ploy or some sort of dance? I think 100 or 150 to 200 is reasonable. Uh, I think it depends. I mean, I yeah. think if a, I think if a, if a supplier is telling you 10,000, then there's a reason. It also depends on the price of the product. If you're talking about, you know, a dollar or two dollar cost product, then 10,000 could very well be, um, could very well be. Um, and also it depends what it, you know, yeah, if it makes sense for that factory to, for 150 units, it might not make sense for that factory to, to customize something. So, um, you know, I've seen numbers like a thousand um that maybe are more reasonable but i think it also depends if the price of the product you're sourcing is like under five bucks then you know three bucks two bucks then ten thousand could be um and you should talk to multiple suppliers and you'll get a feel for what the market is like so if five suppliers are telling you ten thousand then you know then it's not ridiculous it's reality and i also feel like there's a misconception about manufacturers you know like Laurent said, 90% of the world is still made in China. So I'm going to use China as the example. But I think there's a misconception where people think, hey, we're the ones with the money. We're the ones that are the clients. The customer is always the right, you know, always right. We can make our demands. The truth is, sometimes we need them more than they need us. You know, I've been in, and Laurent has too, I'm sure, um, you know, been in these like little, I would call them like podunk cities in China, you know, where there's hardly a paved road and you pull up to every factory and there's 15 Porsches parked up front. Like they are so skilled at what they do. And sometimes they're making so much money. They ain't got time to deal with our bull crap. To Laurent's point with pricing, think about this. If you want, um, you know, a $1 item or a 50 cent item, if you're expecting them to sell you 500 of those and their profit margin is 5%, what's the math on that? They're going to deal with all your emails, all your back and forth collecting payment to make $65. No, it's not worth their time, right? Um, also think about complexity. If I said, hey, I want you to make me this this mouse, I want a new mouse. They've got to write software for it. They've got to custom mold it like that's actually a huge project if I want this customized. So if they say 10,000 units of something custom, it may just be because the investment that they would have to spend in developing this thing, putting together the molds, coming up with the software for it, if it's electronic, coming up with the materials for it. Um, some products have material MOQs. Right. So like if you're doing a special type of plastic, they might not be able to buy three bags of this specific color plastic beads. You have to order a truckload of this stuff because it's a custom Pantone color. Right. So, yeah, the more customized you get, the more of a pain in the butt this product is and the more clients technically that they have business, you know, the, that MOQ and demand is going to go higher and higher and higher. And Tim, some, sometimes that Porsche is missing the E at the end of Porsche. Yeah, it's copycats are rampant in China. I saw like recently Tesla, they were getting not oh, yeah, they yeah. were like identical from our from our friend in China, Chris mm -hmm. Steve. He's a yes. seven figure seller on the summit yeah. as well. So excellent guys. So let's keep going. We're we only have about 10 minutes left. So if you have any questions, now is your chance. All right. So next question is from Chinedu. Have you ever seen demand for your product in another global location? And he followed up saying in another Amazon global location, if so, what steps did you take to expand it to that country? So we're talking about international expansion. Any yeah, so I mean, comments? the good thing about tools like Helium is they'll, sh they'll show you the search volume um, and you can, you can see that. So you can, you can gauge the demand. You can see what competitors are selling using tools. And, it, you know, if you've built up 
decent number of reviews, you can move over the listing with the reviews. And so the best way to go is start focus on one country. Um, and then potentially, you know, you'll need to make a decision at some point based on your capital. Do you move that one product into a different country or do you launch more products in, in the same country? Um, but Helium 10 and, you know, and every other, you know, and lots of other tools can give you the, uh, the sales estimates and keywords, you know, in terms of other countries and what the opportunity is. And I would just say, go after the lowest hanging fruit in your life and your business, right? And consider where you are. If I am in Poland and I want to sell online, I'm probably going to sell in the U.S., right? Because that's the lowest hanging fruit and it's worth my time and investment. If I'm in the U.S. and, and I am in the U.S. and I have never sold internationally. And here's why. Like if I were going to take even a successful product here and launch it in the UK or launch it in France, like there's a lot of work that goes on with that. I have to register the country. I have to worry about VAT. I have to worry about splitting loads now, um, you know, sending some products there. So for me, the number of hours and the headaches and the stress that would take for me, it's been easier just to find another product to launch in the US. So I'm not saying that's right or wrong uh, to, to move globally. Just keep in mind global expansion there are a lot of challenges there so again you know consider where you are and if it's the best move and also keep in mind that sometimes we're being fed false information largely from amazon you know we all get the the amazon emails expand globally it's great it's great it's great but that's from a team who's incentivized to get us to expand globally it doesn't always mean that it's the best fit for your business right right definitely and um Definitely look at the low hanging fruit. You know, I'm currently in Japan. Some of you guys know my story. You know, we're kind of stuck here. So I thought, why not make some lemonade out of lemons, right? Um, even though I don't speak the language, I launched a product in Japan uh, late last year and we, we just sold out the first shipment. We got another shipment in right before Chinese New Year. So, you know, sometimes if you are, if you're not in the US, you know, think about your home country, right? I, I know that people are watching from Japan, you know, from Europe, from, you know, Germany. You know, why not? You know do your home country you probably know the marketplace better and you'll have a like a home field advantage right so yeah it's good advice guys all right Any, anything else before we move on okay so welcome carlos from spain excellent and henry says hi gary give us a step-by-step -step after you find supplier and product and need to ship to usa via air cargo from china yes yeah, step-by-step -step. I did put together a, a roadmap um, some time ago. I, I sent an email out to my email list. If you guys got it, that really did have a step-by-step -step roadmap from you know your product, uh, how to choose a product idea, to sourcing it, to shipping it, to launching it. So if you didn't get that, uh, let me know, and I'm happy to to share that with you guys. But any, any other thoughts on this before we move on? We're good. All right. Robert asks, should we think about moving sourcing to India? What do you think, guys? Yeah, I think I think it I think it depends on your product. India, I think, is good for certain materials, textiles and metals, uh, leather, things like that, um, that it's good for. Um, so I think it really depends on your product. Also recognize that India is slower. Um, as far as production times, but a good person to follow for this is Megla. She has a group. I don't know if she's one of the speakers, Gary. She is. Yeah. She has, Megla, um, Megla Bardwash. You should follow her. She's got a lot of insight into uh, sourcing from India. But um, again, I think it depends on your on your product. Certain products are not uh, are not really doable sourcing from from India. Yeah. And also, India is not necessarily less expensive. Um, I was there in 2000, gosh, 2019 with Megla and man, the, the quality of the products in that very small category of, of materials, like Laurent said, was amazing. It was amazing, but it wasn't necessarily cheap. So I was actually sourcing, uh, at that time, I'm not doing any more, some leather products from India. And like Laurent said, it takes forever. It's slow. Like the logistics system isn't very intact. It's not as advanced as it is in, um, China, but I could also sell it for four times what my less expensive competitors were because the quality was high. So I think that people are thinking India is like the next China. It's not. No way. Like a very, very tiny percentage of what people are sourcing from China can come from India. And even that small percentage that can come from India is going to be slow and it's going to be expensive. But 
if you can find a products made in India, they are technically or typically willing to do business with you. Like they'll they'll bend over backwards to make sure your samples are perfect, to make sure your MOQ is extremely low for customized products. Um, it's just hard to find the right product. Yeah, and I can also weigh in about India. Um, I was on the uh, with Megla on the India sourcing trip along with Tim. And uh, one of the things that surprised me is the MOQs can be much, much lower than China. You know, China, usually we're talking 500. India could be as low as 100 or even 50. The pricing may be higher, but the, the MOQ may be lower. So if you're thinking about, you know, placing small bets, possibly launching, you know, a couple of different SKUs rather than just one, that's one strategy. But I agree, it does take longer. But something else that a lot of people overlook is India doesn't have Chinese New Year. So when China's shut down, I mean, India is still open for business. So for right now, it might make sense to see if your product is um, you know, makeable in, in India. And definitely check out Megala's session on day three. You know, she's going to talk about best practices sourcing from India, Robert. So I hope that helps. Uh, we only have a few minutes left. I want to just keep going. I think we have a few more questions. Ask me. What's the best way to get the operations in order like a proper business when you are starting off and get the procedures written and flow charts drawn up? Operations question, guys. What's the it's not a three-minute answer, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I think first, you know, getting set up as a business, you know, depending on where you are in the world, you probably want to get some advice there. Um, probably have some kind of entity, whether that's you know, in the US or not, but um, I started out, um, you know, re I recommend you have some kind of corporation or some kind of protection uh, from an entity standpoint. Um, and then, yeah, there's there's lots of training out there um, on SOPs um, and outsourcing. Um, one guy is Nathan Hirsch, who's got, he's got a um, thing called Outsource School, which you can, you can find, he's probably, I don't know. He's, he's on our summit as well. Nathan he's on the summit. Um, yeah. I recommend you watch his his presentation. Uh, he's uh, got a lot of experience with hiring VAs and and um, writing up uh, writing up procedures. But if you think of it as sim simplistically, it's creating a document, sharing what you do and how to go about doing it in step step by step format, whether it's video or work, you know, written or or whatever. Uh, that's in its uh, simplistic form. Excellent. All right, that's great. Um, and last question before we go: How important is the factory inspection? Do you do it all? Do you do it every time? Uh, very important, and you should do it all the time. Inspect what you expect. Love it. All right. So, on that note, um, thank you, everybody. For tuning in and uh hi richard from guangzhou yeah great to see you he's an alumni of our seven figure summit, summit speaker as well so great guys thank you so much everyone for coming on um thank you everybody for watching any final uh comments or feedback guys nope that's it thanks for having us yep all right so this has been day one fundamentals recap Tuning in live with you guys with Karen Thomas, Leron Hirschkorn, and Tim Jordan. This is Gary Huang, and we will see you at the next session. Thanks so much, guys. Bye, everyone. Thanks, Gary. Thank you. Thanks. See you guys.